to everlasting. The Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. The everlasting love of the Lord our God has been with us this week. It's a love that is divine. It's a love that excels. And so we stand and celebrate God's love. And in love, God invites us to bring all we need before him. And so we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Father, we thank you for your love, your divine love, your love that has loved us from the beginning of time, your love that came after us and called us to yourself, your love that has graced this past week, your love that will be with us as we go forward in life, that will remain with us to eternity. Father, we thank you for your amazing love, its richness, its fullness, the blessing it is to us. You are an incredible God of love, and we give you thanks and praise. Amen. Please feel free to be seated, and I can't see Yvonne. Oh, there she is. Yvonne's going to read 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 14. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Thank you, Yvonne. What you should have uh, somewhat near you is a sheet of paper. And what I want you to do is draw around your hand 
and then cut it out. If your hand happens to be bigger than mine and doesn't fit on a sheet of A5, I do have some sheets of A4 here. Uh, so uh, you need a copy of your hand. Hopefully paper, pens, scissors are somewhere near you. Uh, there are a few scissors on chairs that are unoccupied, so feel free to raid them. But you need your hand. And just roughly cut it out. There are some scissors behind Ed and some scissors over there as well. There are some uh, left-handed scissors here at the front, if you're left-handed. Oh, Jane. Jane's left hand. I won't throw them to you. <laughs> do, you do you know where uh, the root derivation of the word left-handed in Latin comes from? Sinister. Sinister. <laughs> so Thanks, Rex. Uh, it's just one of those interesting facts, isn't it? It's all to do with the, the army. If you were left-handed, you could cheat in a battle, apparently. Great. Have we all... You want a, a pair? There you are, Willis. Great. Has uh, everyone got their hand? Hopefully you've got five fingers on it. Well, four fingers and a thumb, unless you've got six fingers or possibly lost one, in which case you just need to be slightly more imaginative. I'd like you... I'll just give you uh, 30 more seconds to cut... I'm going when Patrick's finished. <laughs> so his grand's going, go slower, Patrick. Go faster, Patrick. <laughs> oh, Patrick. <laughs> Great. So if you could grab a pen or uh, there are one or two spare ones jotted round. And our reading said we're one body but made up of many parts. And all of us are different, yet able through the Holy Spirit to be one. And I want you, on your first finger or thumb, to write one of the fruits of the Spirit that can be seen in you. So love, joy, peace. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. One of the fruits that you think is particularly seen in you. Okay. Whichever one you want. We're going to be writing five things, so... <laughs> Okay, so on the first finger, one of the fruits of the Spirit that can be seen in you. On the second finger, a gift 
that you have. Okay? Doesn't have to be one of the spiritual gifts mentioned, but something that you are good at or you excel at. So we've got a fruit, a gift. On the third finger, I'd like you to write one way in which you help someone else. One act of service you regularly next to you who's not, uh, who doesn't regularly come to church. Okay. So we've got a fruit, a gift, an act of service, a person. And on the last finger, I'd like you to write a dream you have for this church. Something you'd like to see happen, this church to be. You think, wouldn't it be great if God did this? Had a youth group of 500 or something like that. Okay. Right, what we should have dotted around the room, uh, there are five of them, one's near Wendy, if you could hold it up, is kind of a, a cardboard, it, it is going to be a hoop, so there's one there, has anyone else got one? Janet's got one, Andy's got one, Willis has got one, you might need to give it to your grandma. Trust Rika a bit more. I think there's another one down here, is there? One next to Elaine. So uh, we're, we're going to trust Adol to do... No, they're handing it to Marlene, delegating responsibility. What I want you to do, 50 people to a ring, stick your hands round the outside of the ring. And uh, when you've got your hands stuck round the outside of the ring, if you can bring the five rings forward, and hopefully Karen and I will, will do something with them to join them together as a, a symbol of our unity. So uh, go and find someone with one of the rings, stick them all down... The people with the rings will have a piece of paper to show how it's done. So we want to.
but uh, we will get some more. Today. I think along with uh, more scissors. Great. Have we got the hoops anywhere near? Finished? Sorry? Oh, thanks. We'll just try and get a few of them. We'll stick the U, uh, but not over the, as long as it's not over the kind of. You want to be able to see. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Andrew. Actually, we'll just wait a minute, because we, we'll need to hook it, them in. But we've got to be able to spell it, so. Yeah, hook one in. We'll hook them in first. Just doing some uh, construction at the front, and we're just waiting for a. A few more rings to come. We need two more rings. Obviously the right side of the church, as I sit, are more on the ball than the left side. Great, let's have it, Kathy. Great, thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Willis. Yours looks great. Fantastic. And uh, poor Karen has the uh, task of assembling what I want. And while uh, poor Karen is uh, assembling things, uh, we're going to uh, recognize that everyone needs compassion, especially Karen.
Father, we thank you for your great compassion that has been poured out on us through Jesus Christ. Your love that has touched us and graced our lives, we thank you. You're a great God. Amen. Please feel free to be seated. We can't quite see our rings, but we have unity, despite the fact we're all very, very different. And it's just a reminder that in the power of the Holy Spirit, very, very different people can be united together because of him. Children and young people, feel free to go to your groups John Fawcett was born in a poor part of Bradford. He was orphaned at the age of 12. He became a tailor and he was largely self-educated. He was converted by the preaching of George Whitfield at the age of 16 and began preaching soon after. I wonder if we would give 16, 17-year-olds the opportunity to preach. But in days gone by, if you became a Christian, (laughs) you were given the opportunity. Uh, So he began to preach uh, shortly after he was converted. He was called to a poor Baptist church at Waynesgate, which is in, uh, in Hebden Bridge. Seven years later, he received a call from a very large church in London, Carter's Lane. He accepted the call, preached his final sermon, and on the day of the departure, the wagon was loaded with his goods. The distraught congregation gathered around and begged him to stay. We're talking the the 1800s. So we're talking big operation to load your car and then transport down to London. And the love and the tears of the congregation prevailed as he decided not to move. They unloaded the wagon and put all the furniture back in the house. He received many other invitations but declined them all and stayed with his people. The people that loved him and pleaded with him to remain You might wonder why I tell you that story. Well, out of that experience, he wrote a hymn. I'm looking for some of the older ones to kind of come up with the answer. Thank you, Derek. Blessed be the tie that binds. It is. Blessed be the tie that binds. I know it's a very old hymn, but it captures something of what can happen when the power of the Holy Spirit falls upon a congregation and there's unity in him.
together in prayer. And we're grateful for the way in which God unites us, but we want to uh, pray for our Christian brothers and sisters, particularly in the Ukraine, and uh, join with the churches in praying uh, a prayer that uh, is being encouraged uh, for Christians to pick up as we then go on to pray for our leaders and ourselves. God of all peoples and nations, who created all things alive and breathing, united and whole, show us the way of peace that is your overwhelming presence. We hold before you the peoples of Ukraine and Russia, every child and every adult. We long for the time when weapons of war are beaten into plowshares, when nations no longer lift up sword against nation, we cry out to you for peace. Protect those who only desire and deserve to live in security and safety. Comfort those who fear for their lives and the lives of their loved ones. Be with those who are bereaved. Change the hearts <coughs> of those who are set on violence and aggression and fill leaders with the wisdom that leads to peace. Kindle again in us a love of our neighbour, and a passion for justice to prevail, and a renewed recognition that we all play a part in peace. Creator of all, hear our prayer, and bring us peace. Make us whole. Amen. Heavenly Father, we continue to pray for our government, for godly men and women to influence and for righteousness and justice to flourish in whatever party and uh, in whatever way is happening. Our hearts are sad by what we've heard this week of what has gone on in the corridors of power, not only amongst the politicians, but amongst the civil servants as well. We pray for an end to all uh, toxic habits and attitudes, for your rule to be upheld, and for all culture to be honourable. We pray for compassion within our government, for those that are increasingly going to find it a struggle to make ends meet for good decisions by those making decisions, both for the leaders and the families themselves. We pray for the children that are vulnerable, for whom a meal on the table is not always guaranteed. We thank you for those schools and those churches that are stepping into the gap to make a difference. We pray that people won't jump on the back of what's happening and fill uh, the arena with fearful rhetoric and cause panic, but there'd be a measured and responsible dialogue so that the very best can be done for all in the challenges ahead. We pray for ourselves as a church. We pray for our mission. We cry out as Rachel did, give us children, spiritual offspring. We pray that as individuals and as a church, we would hunger to see people come to faith. That we'd long for hell to be plundered and heaven populated by those confessing Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord. We ask for your favour, that we might influence and have conversations with those that are yet to know Jesus. We pray for your blessings on all that we deliberately do for your glory's sake. Amen.
Amen. I do want to uh, remind you that on Wednesday is a day of prayer and fasting. At 8 o'clock we'll meet in the worship area uh, for those that are able as we continue to seek uh, God's leading and guiding of us over these next couple of months. God clearly said when we last prayed, wait. Oh, uh, how I hate waiting. I really like doing things now, but sometimes you've just got to be obedient because God's got a plan and he wants you to be obedient first. And the temptation is we dive in unorganized because we're good at it when he says, wait, I'll do things in my own time. So we meet to pray and hear what God is saying to us. If you can't meet, pray through the day. Feel free to feed back what you've sense the spirit saying to you uh, mentioned to one of the leadership team tim's here joy's here i'm just seeing who else uh and mike's here carol's there uh so if you don't know who to feed to sorry you were pointing pointing somewhere tim i've already mentioned haven't i yeah, yeah, great. Uh, just feed back to us and we can feed that into the uh, uh, considerations of the leadership team. Great. Joy. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that by all means possible, you reach out and win and influence people for your kingdom. We pray uh, for this booklet that's being handed out by so many people, that the faith of the Queen can stir people to ask spiritual questions in these uncertain times. So we pray that you would bless us as we hand them to our neighbours as we share them with those you lay on our hearts. We commit that to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to uh, read again from Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And Yvonne is going to read for us verses 1 to 6. And then Ernest will come and bring God's word to us. No, she's not. Yeah. I'm on the ball this morning for the first time ever. As I give a merit for the Lord, so I urge you to lead a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen. Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you all again for the very 
very warm welcome. Um, thank you, Pastor John, and uh, thank you for inviting me here um, to this lovely church that uh, can share God's word together. Um, yes, a little bit of myself just to introduce. Um, I serve as a, as a church elder at the Chinese Church in London, and our church has several locations. The one that I'm serving in is in Soho which is about just a few hundred yards from, from the uh, Chinatown. And uh, it's so uplifting to hear the story of uh, John Fawcett. Um, it's about in the year 1887, just about 70 years after John has gone to be with the Lord, and the Soho Baptist Chapel was built. And this is the building that we are currently holding our Sunday services. So here's a bit of connection we have here. Um, we thank the Lord that we can share in the same body of Christ. Let's begin with a word, with a word of prayer. Lord, as we open your word, speak to us through your spirit. Just as you spoke to Paul when he wrote this letter to the Ephesians. Holy Spirit, come and speak to us individually in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's take this back. Okay. Well, I understand that um, John is telling me that uh, you've just finished a sermon series on the uh, topic of the uh, Holy Spirit. And you're just about to embark or continuing on the book of Acts from chapter 9 onwards. This is such a good combination and complementation as well. There's a lot of uh, scholars actually saying the book of Acts is actually the Acts of the Apostles and the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And so with the two combinations, it's really good to see what God is doing and what God was doing in the early church as well. I wonder whether you have um, traveled um, in the train or in the underground, as, and as soon as the train reached the, uh, the overground, um, you're probably doing some readings or having some quiet, quietness, reading a book, reading some papers, or having a nap, like I do. And then there's a shout, there's a very loud noise. You hear someone actually speaking very loudly into their phones. Have you come across that? Woke you up from your nap. <clears throat> now, I'm, I'm not a person who likes to eavesdrop, but I call this kind of thing, it's kind of forced eavesdropping. You know, even with my earphones on, I could still hear the noise. And you can guess sometimes, even though it was a, a one-way conversation, you can somehow guess what the topic was, what the subject matter was. You know, it could be a business transaction, it could be a domestic incident, um, it could be an argument, an appointment. And you, so, you can also somehow guess the relationship as well, from the caller and the receiver, whether they are friends, whether they are hostile to each other, whether it was a formal conversation, and so on. Right, reading a letter from Paul is something like that as well. It's quite similar, because it's a one-way conversation. You read the book of Ephesians, you know what Paul is saying, but somehow you can guess what he was trying to address to the people in Ephesus. So certainly, we know the book of Ephesians was written by Paul, because in chapter 1, verse 1, Paul introduced himself. He said, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. You see, the way they write letters is very, it's very similar, but somehow the order is slightly different. The author actually put their names first. When they write the letter today, we, we, we try to say, dear so-and-so, right, at the beginning. And then right at the end. So sometimes I have to scroll all the way to my emails or my letters, I have to flip all the way to the end and say, oh, so, so that's John writing a letter to me. But in the early days, it wasn't like that. The author actually put their name first. So chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So Paul wrote this letter. 
And also, Paul's relationship with the, with the um, Ephesians is quite clear as well. We know that Paul has been to Ephesus a couple of times. Um, the map here is quite useful. So Paul went to Ephesus during his second and his third missionary journeys. And in Acts chapter 20, it records um, the third missionary journey. So Paul was actually coming back from his third missionary journey. He went to Ephesus, all the way to Europe and come back. And on his way back, he stopped at Miletus. Now, he was, Acts chapter 20 was telling us that Paul wants to go back to Jerusalem in order to, um, in the right time for the day of Pentecost. So he wants to celebrate that festival in Jerusalem. So when he reached Miletus, which is about 50 miles from Ephesus, instead of going to Ephesus, which is in the opposite direction, in which case he wouldn't be able to do it in time to go back to Jerusalem because it's still a long way back to Jerusalem. So he called for the elders to come and meet him in Miletus, about 50 miles away. So then the elders came and saw him and Paul spoke to them. Little did they know that it was probably his final words to the elders. And then after that, he went back to Jerusalem. Interesting, in Acts chapter 20, verse 37, it says that um, there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him. How many times have you seen a few grown men kneeling, embracing, and weeping at the same time? Well, Paul and these elders must be very close friends, right? They're brothers. They're co-workers. Paul's actually spent quite a few years in Ephesus, building the church there, nourishing, um, establishing, developing brothers and sisters there. You don't do these kind of things with strangers, do you? So in a way, we can see Paul has a very special relationship with the brothers and sisters in the church in Ephesus. And sure enough, soon after Paul returned to Jerusalem, he was arrested and imprisoned. So the letter to the, to the Ephesians is one of the letters written when Paul was in prison. How do we know that? Because it's pretty obvious from the book of Ephesians. <clears throat> um, chapter 3, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 1, chapter 6, verse 20, Paul is addressing himself as a prisoner for Christ Jesus, a prisoner for the Lord, an ambassador in chains. So it's very likely that he was under house arrest, as recorded in Acts chapter 28. Paul was allowed to stay by himself, of course, with a soldier guarding him, but he was free to meet with people who, come, who came to visit him. And he was that he built for the brothers and sisters, for the leaders, for the elders that he met over the, in those two years. And in maybe in those two years, he had the time to write these four prison letters, the so-called letters that he was written while he was in prison. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. So just to give a very brief summary of what the book of Ephesians is, and may I borrow from uh, our late beloved um, Pastor John Stott. He said, <clears throat> very simply, chapters 1 to 3, it's saying what God has done. And then from chapters 4 to 6 is what we must be and what we must do. It's very simple, but it's very good um, analysis and description of the letter to the Ephesians. So chapter 4 is the beginning and what we have read earlier on. Right at the beginning about what we must be and what we must do, Paul starts this section with this topic on unity. So that's how important it is. Before we talk about the relationship between husband and wife and, 
an employer and employees, parents and children, Paul starts with unity of the spirit. In verse 1, he says, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling, <clears throat> worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So what is this calling? What have we been called? If you read the, the whole letter thoroughly, you find that there is a, a, a central theme to what Paul is trying to communicate. He's telling the people in, in Ephesus, God is creating a new order. He's creating a new people, one people. You see, when God created the world, men and women, animals and plants, and, and it was a perfect world, but sin entered the world through disobedience. The once harmonious world was now corrupt, broken. I don't know about you, I don't know about you, but when I was younger, many, many, many years ago, I, uh, I used to like watching superheroes cartoons. don't know whether, you know, <laughs> what is your favorite character in there. My favorite character was Superman. Remember that? Faster than a speeding bullet. I don't think they use this slogan anymore. You know, more powerful than a locomotive, what we call trains nowadays. Able to leap a tall building in a single bound. He was called a man of steel. And yet, he was kind, he was nice, um, he was ready to save the world and to unite the people. But we all know that Superman was just, you know, a fictitious character. It doesn't exist. But there is a historical figure that united the whole world. And not only united the whole world, he was uniting the whole of creation. And that's in the book of Ephesians. God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, into the world to reconcile men to God. And this is what Paul is talking about. Christ is here to restore the order so that we may become a new people, the one people. But how can we achieve that? <clears throat> how can we achieve this one people? Well, God has a plan, and that plan is the church, the body of Christ. And here we are as a church on earth to demonstrate that, to show God's plan for humankind. God has no plan B. So what if the church fails? Oh, let's see. If the church fails, let's execute plan B or C. No, that's the only plan. And Christ will be coming back for his bride, for his church. So make sure the church still exists. <clears throat> so the church has a very important role, is to show to this world that this one people of God, we are his people. But how? So in verse 2, Paul says that with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another. Humility and gentleness. Well, it's the opposite, perhaps, to arrogance or self-centeredness, which we are probably more um, familiar with. It's not easy to think of... Uh, Humility and gentleness, isn't it? It's more than just not being arrogant or not being self-centered. It's also to think of others as well, to see the strengths in other people. You may say, <laughs> you're kidding me, right? You're kidding me. Gentle, humble, this kind of people cannot survive in this cutthroat competitive society. Everybody, every man for himself. That's how we survive, right? And this is what the society is telling us. People often mistaken humility and gentleness as um, weakness. Or degrading yourself, or belittling yourself, devaluing yourself, and losing your self-confidence. 
That's not the case. Jesus said, I'm humble. I'm gentle. Jesus never lost his way. Never lost his identity. But he was humble. He was gentle. I like the way Rick Warren says it. <clears throat> humility. He says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. It's not devaluing ourselves. It's not looking down upon ourselves. We are all created in the image of God. We are equal in God's sight. But humility is think of others before yourself. Think of ourselves less. And having the ability to see the strength in other people and not seeking glory just for ourselves. It's so true, isn't it, in today's society? In, um, in the media, in the advertisement, always project this image that I do it, I can, I'm worth it, I want to have it my way. That kind of concept, I, I, me. If we bring this concept, the I concept, the me concept into the church, then unity would be difficult. This kind of concept will kill off unity quite easily. It's not only just the church, right? For those of us who are working or have been working for many years, we all know that in any project team, in any workplace, if everybody for themselves, it's not going to work, right? The project is going to fail. You've got to work together. You've got to unite. Warren Wearsby <coughs> said something. He, um, I quite like the way he puts it. He says, it's amazing how much God can accomplish if his workers don't care who gets the credit. It's so true, isn't it? If we serve together, and if all of us try to grab credits, you know, I did it, you know, you should praise me for it, then it's not going to work. You break the unity. But it's amazing how much God can accomplish if his workers don't really care. We just serve the Lord. We don't care who's, who gets the credits. And then Paul continues in verse 2. He says, with patience, bearing with one another. And this is the second ingredient, not just humility and gentleness. With patience, bearing with one another. Again, being impatient and not bearing with one another is also a killer for unity. We all know that we have our own preference. We like certain colors. We like certain ways of doing things. We have our own style of doing things. But we have to be patient and bearing with one another. And someone said to me candidly, and uh, he was saying as a friend, to overcome impatience, you need to exercise mind over matter. You know, zzz, have, make it happen. But he, what he was saying is, if you don't mind, then it doesn't matter. Do you get it? So often we take ourselves very seriously, too seriously. We should take other people seriously. But sometimes I don't have to take myself too seriously. I don't mind. If you like it that way, just do it that way. I'm not going to argue with you about certain little things. I don't mind. In that case, it doesn't matter anymore. A lot of problems, arguments can be resolved. If we have a little more patience, willing to listen, bearing with one another in love, you see the Ephesians actually achieved that. If you look further back into the book of Revelation, one of the church, seven churches in there is the, the church in Ephesus. And the Lord himself commended the church in Ephesus. He said, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. The Christians in Ephesus actually are patient. They are enduring. Actually, you got the verse here. In verse 3, 
I know you are, you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. They did it. And so can we, bearing with one another in love. The second ingredient, and the third, <clears throat> Paul is telling us to eager to maintain the unity of of the spirit in the bond of peace. Yes, you may ask, isn't that God's work? Indeed, yes. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross has broken the walls, the partition of hostility. True. Isn't that the work of the Holy Spirit? Indeed, yes. The Holy Spirit has provided the foundation, the, the basis for our unity. Indeed, it's in Acts chapter 2, it was God who declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. It's not the elder or the pastor who says, Spirit, come and fill these guys. No, it was God. His will is to pour out his spirit on all flesh. And yet, we have a part to play as well. You see, in our church as well, we, when we train our Bible study group leaders or we maybe alpha, alpha hosts or um, life group leaders and so on. You see, apart from teaching them the principle of being a group leader, um, we also like them to have hands-on experience, right? We want them to get involved. We want them to come away from being a spectator. You know, look how I lead a group. And now, it's their way, it's their opportunity to lead the group. And most of the time, they will say, no, 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 I'm, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet. I need more training. No, you don't need more training. You just do it now. So in order to let them have the uh, hands-on experience, and the more they do it, the more they will see the needs in the small group, right? And when they see the needs, they will start praying for the people, and they start caring for the group members. And in that way, they get involved. They get the ownership. They participate in this group. In the same way, unity is not about our knowledge of unity. God wants us to be involved. Yes, he did all the foundation, the basis for unity is done for us. And Paul is saying, we have to be eager to maintain the spirit of unity. Eager in the original text means to make every effort, to labor, to endeavor. So we have to do some action, is a verb. And finally, <clears throat> in verses 4 to 6, the basis for our unity. We read the, um, the Bible reading earlier on. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. We often like to look at our differences. But Paul states here that we have more things in common than our differences. He listed at least seven here, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God. And one God is all one. You can no more divide one God can you, than can you divide the church. In other words, if you divide the church, it's like as if you are dividing God. There is only one God, one church. This is the foundation of our unity. Of course, in the 21st century, we need to manifest to show the world in our present church. Yes, I know there is an, an invisible, universal church of Christ across the boundary, across the, the years, across the location. But there is also a visible, local church. This is the church that is visible to the world. And this is why unity in the spirit is so important because the world is watching. They can see us. They cannot see the invisible universal church, but they can see us in Teddington, 
in London, in Soho, and they're watching. You see, 2,000 years ago, in the Middle East culture, in a typical Jewish community, in their minds, there are only two types of people. Very simple. The Jewish people, who are the chosen people of God, and other people, they call Gentiles, the defiled, or sometimes they even call them dogs, the uncircumcised, the outsiders. And you know what happened? These people are found in, they didn't have churches those days, in a room, in a house. The two hostile people sat in the same room. They are reconciled. Amazing, unthinkable. That's why in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is saying this, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought nearby, but brought near by the blood of Christ. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. We can see the world is divided. We can see people against people, nation against nation. You just need to read the news, though. I don't need to tell you more about this. We just had two world wars in the 20th century, and the Afghan war is still skirmishing in the background, and yet the Ukraine war has already started. But Christ came to bring in the new order, a new people. He was sorting out the root problem in the human race. So in the first century Palestinian um, area, in Palestine, in Asia Minor, it was unthinkable that in a place where Jews and Gentiles could be in the same room, not just sitting there, they were sharing communion. They were worshipping the same God. It was unthinkable. But Christ has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. It's only in Christ and in Christ alone we can share this unity of the Spirit. It's only not just for this time. I, I like the rings here that's putting all our hands together. Rings signifying there's no starting, no ending, right? It's not just unity, but it's also eternity. Forever in Christ. It's not only just on earth, but it's for eternity. That's what Christ has done for us. So, brothers and sisters, the church of Christ has to demonstrate this to the world. If the Christian people cannot demonstrate this unity of the Spirit, then what chance does the world have? Just uh, to close, uh, just uh, a small short story. Um, <clears throat> I was born in Malaysia. So in 1969, May the 13th, there was a riot in Malaysia. It's a major riot. And due to the conflict between the Malays and the Chinese, and after the, the election, so I won't go into the politics because not much was being recorded, but staff has to say that many Malays and Chinese were killed in those riots. <clears throat> I was in primary school, and since the riot, um, we were being told the Malays were the bad guys, never trust them. There was racial hatred mutually expressed. In West Malaysia, of course, it's slightly different because the Malays who are born to be Muslims by law, they were not permitted to enter a church. And the church should not invite any Muslims there. It's a criminal offence. If the church does that, it would be shut down. In 1985, it was about 16 years after the riots, I went to East Malaysia. In East Malaysia, it's slightly different. I went there to visit a missionary couple. The policy there is slightly different. 
the Bumiputra, meaning the native people, well, some of them are Malays, they were given the religious freedom. They can choose their own religion. So there are quite a few um, Christians among the native people, some of the tribes like Iban tribes and, and the uh, Kadazan tribe, they became Christians. So when I visited this couple, a missionary couple, they took me obviously to their church and visited their church. And I, I really can't forget that moment when I entered the church. I met someone who looked like a Malay, a Muslim. And he walked towards me. He held his hand out and shook my hand. And he said this. And, well, he introduced himself first. And the name obviously sounds like a Malay name. <clears throat> and he said, welcome, brother. It's no big deal, right, to all of us here. It's, you know, we do that all the time. Hey, welcome. Hey, sister. Hey, brothers. Hang on. Have you forgotten that riots? Have you forgotten all the Chinese people that you killed? Have you forgotten about the, the hatred, all the bad things that you have done? Only 16 years ago, I never met a Malay Christian. He was the first. At that moment, I think I truly experienced and understood the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Christ has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. No philosophy, no politics on earth is greater than this unity which spans us to eternity. So maybe something for us to ponder as well. If this unity of the spirit is so important to us, to the church, definitely to Christ, then how do we live it out? How do we live out this unity? <coughs> Perhaps, I just wonder, if, if there are strangers actually walk into our church in Soho, in Teddington, will they see us as one people? Will they see that? Perhaps it's our food for thought. Let's pray. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Thank you, Lord, for uniting us in your spirit. Yes, Lord, only you could do that. But help us, Lord, daily to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have called us. Give us a strength. And Holy Spirit, help us and lead us every day to walk in your path and in your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so we're going to close as we sing Holy Spirit, living breath of God, as we invite God to do his work among us.
appreciate prayer at the close of the service. There'll be people here at the front willing to pray with you. There'll be tea and coffee in the atrium. Uh, we read against the words of Ephesians 4. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of praise. May his Spirit live in us so that his glory may be seen by others. Amen. Amen.